Hey everybody, welcome back this week. Oh boy, am I excited to talk about this. The Undiscovered Self by Carl Jung. What I consider to be the great political treatise of the 20th century. The greatest political treatise of the 20th century. Perhaps the greatest political treatise of all time. And I have read, and I do know the impact of John Locke's two treaties. Also an important treatise. I mean, it has treatise in the title. How could it not be important? But I think this may be more important because it deals with an issue more fundamental. Yes, more fundamental than man's rights. It's an issue that, I mean, do we talk about, I mean, yeah, we talk about it to some degree. Well, no, I think that's the thing. And I think that's what makes this book incredibly important is this issue is all around us. We, we're struggling with it constantly, especially given, given that it's an election year. But we don't know it. And Jung speaks directly to it. And I think that's why, man, it just doesn't get more important than this book. Also, what doesn't get more important is animusempire.com slash schedule. If you feel lost, if you feel stuck, not sure what steps to take in your life. I get it. It's a big, confusing world out there. But I do know that uh, scheduling a 30-minute free consultation with me is a step in the right direction. Either I can help or I can point you in a direction that would be more helpful. Overview. Is this recording? Yeah, okay, this is still recording. Overview, part one, context. Part two through five, I'm going to talk about themes that I think are important. I'm going to take quotations from the book. I mean, I've, I've read this. I, I just read this last week, but I read it once before in 2013, and this was a huge wake-up call for me. I mean, it, it, and it was such a wake well, the, yeah, the reason why it was such a wake-up call is because I was kind of thinking in this direction to begin with. But then I read this book, and it really made it clear to me. So I'm going to talk about themes from the book, quotations that I've made over the years, or, yeah, you know, that I've underlined or bracketed. These themes are individual versus the state, the state as religion, the religious function, the religious function in man, and collectivism. And then part six will be the solution. Jung offers some kind of a solution, and I may offer some kind of solution. All right, so part one, context. This was written in the spring of 1956, and Jung died in 1961. Not the last thing that he ever wrote, but I think it's up there. I think the last thing he ever wrote was that essay in uh, Man and His Symbols, Approaching the Unconscious, which wasn't anything new. He, he wrote it particularly, yeah, specifically for popular consumption. So it wasn't original. It wasn't intended to be anything new. So this may be, I'm not fully versed. Whenever I think I'm fully versed in, in Jung's uh, bibliography or, or Jung's catalog, I, there's always something else that crops up. So I can't say for sure, but I think this may be the last, the last thing that he originally wrote. Um, so it's really, uh, I think a great end point uh, of where he leaves off his career and like the, this this calling that he has uh, for for the future. Purpose of this uh, this book is well, I mean, why in this age of science? I mean, this is the big question. I have it here: the Star Trek dilemma. <laughs> about thirty five percent of Star Trek episodes are about this theme exactly. Why in the age of science and reason? Are we, do we seem to be going backwards when it comes to politics? Empiricism, rationalism, these are all great things, but why can't we apply it to politics? What's going on? And when, you know, we, we write books about this. It's not like we can't deconstruct things and say what's important. Again, John Locke, two treatises, but we just seem to be missing a, a fundamental point that can really be, best be demonstrated or at least exposed to some degree by a sweet speech by, uh, by Captain Kirk. But even that really doesn't hit the nail on the head. I mean, yeah, <laughs> this book is essentially, it's a short book. It's, I think my version is 112 pages. I have the 2006 uh, Signet Classic, or just Signet version. It has Young smoking a pipe on the front. I, I think that's the main one. I'm, this will be relevant because I'm going to use uh, page numbers here, not paragraph numbers, which I, I think this was another reason why this book was really never meant to be written specifically uh, but I guess it needed to be written. No paragraph numbers, just page numbers. And also talks about why calls for practicality and common sense are, are vapid and completely miss the point. Can't we just have a common sense healthcare policy? Can't we have a common sense 
foreign intervention, foreign policy. Why, why, are the, like, it just seems like the right, come on, can't we just ha- have uh, the different sides of each party just get along? It, it calls for that, completely missed the point. Um, and also I think it helps explain what's going on with the divisive alt-right and the SJWs from the right and left, uh, you know, respectively. Why you can't just walk up to an SJW and say, see, doesn't make logical sense. Don't you see that, that you, you, you want to end racism, but you are, in, in, in a sense, invoking racism to try to end racism? It doesn't make sense. Can't you just see the facts of the, the situation? It's like it just doesn't get through. And I think it also draws parallels between the state and the individual. Implicitly, that's what this book does. I mean, everything that we can say about the state and what's wrong with the state or the neurosis of tyranny is really the neurosis of the individual, just on a different scale. Yeah, it's probably, that's one of the great political treaties because it doesn't talk about politics, really. I mean, it kind of does. I mean, it's a, the, yeah, it's, it's called the undiscovered self. It's a political treatise that talks, that's just talking about the self. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's so important. And really, this is what I appreciate about Jordan Peterson, although I disagree with some of the things that he says. I mean, he's really the crossfit of psychology. Uh, But people are now starting to talk about these issues because of him and at least pointing people in the direction of going, yeah, he's the crossfit of uh, psychology. Crossfit's kind of stupid, but at least when I go to the gym now, there's lifting platforms and bumper plates. And Jordan Peterson, uh, not that what he says is anything wrong in particular, but... It's definitely not complete. It's far from complete. But at least more people are reading Jung and getting tuned into these ideas. So that's what he deals with this in this book. And I guess a two-thirds spoiler. You know in movies they kind of show you the ending or, or the scene right before the ending then go back to the beginning. What did I just watch? Oh, yeah, I just watched Kill Bill 1. Where they, they, you, you know in the beginning, in the opening scene, she has uh, Oshi Ren or Ishi Ren. Uh, the character played by Lucy Liu. She has her name crossed off, so you know she kills her in the beginning. But then they go back to the beginning and you say, well, how does this happen? So this is the two-thirds spoiler of this uh, podcast, this presentation, is that um, religion is something inherent in psychology. And the state is something. The procession of the state is something that is uh, inherently a religious uh, artifact as a projection of a religious a religious artifact of man um yeah why would you I, I guess i just said why would a political treatise be titled the undiscovered self religion is this thing that we all have and if we don't tend to it in the right way it may project out in even stranger ways as ever as as strange as christianity may be and there are definitely parts of it that are strange again i'm not even a christian it's not even about that we have to recognize as part of us, and if we don't, it might get really weird. I think the same thing happened with sexuality in the 50s through the 70s, or so I hear. There's a sexual revolution. We became just more in touch with the fact that sexuality is a huge part of our psychology. It's neither bad, it's neither good, it's all in how we express it. And I'm not saying the everything in the sexual revolution was right. I mean, you know, you know this, I, sex is a fundamental good. But that doesn't mean every expression of sex is fundamentally good. It all comes down to your intention. It's not about being celibate or being promiscuous. It's what do you use sex for? I think Rand summarizes it very well. I mean, it's a high order. It's a huge conceptual framework that she puts it in, but she, it's a good summation. Well, that's what most good summations are. Was, do, you use, do you use sex to get self-esteem or gain self-esteem? Or express self-esteem. Those are the same thing. Excuse me. Do you use sex to gain self-esteem or to express your self-esteem? Huge difference. So we had a sexual revolution where we realized that the sexuality thing is a huge part of our psychology. I think now it's time for a religious revolution, a small r religious revolution to recognize the same thing about our, our religious function like we did our sexual function. And this is, yeah, this book was a, just a huge, I mean, I mean, this helped so much. You know, it's like one of those things I forget. It, it was it was so impactful that I forget. It, they, they, there's that monk or that Catholic priest. Somebody said it. I think it was some Catholic Jesuit guy back in the Middle Ages. 
something up to the effect of even if a miracle did happen in your life, you would forget about it six months later. I mean, obviously I'm butchering that, but that's what happened. That's what this book is. And to me, it's like a miracle that I forgot about because I was having a very difficult time at my first graduate school dealing, dealing with SJWs and saying like, it just doesn't make sense. Can't you see how this doesn't make sense? I remember in particular pointing out that their whole worldview is based on this, some zero sum premise. I mean, which it is. I mean, we're talking about privilege and, the have and have nots, the white and white nots, it's the same thing. This is all based on this worldview that is fundamentally incorrect. Don't you see how logical it is? And the blank stare I got back. I mean, it was very strange to me, but this book really made it clear about why that was happening. And it wasn't because I, yeah, it was because I wasn't communicating very well. I didn't really understand what was going on. I was using the lo- the, the wrong language, so to speak. All right, part two, the theme of the individual versus the state. This quotation is from page 12. The moral responsibility of the individual is inevitably replaced by the policy of the state. Instead of moral and mental differentiation of the, of the individual, you have public welfare and the raising of the living standards. The goal and meaning of individual life, which is the only real life, no longer lie in individual development, but in the policy of the state. So what he's talking about here is if there is no, if you get rid of individual integrity, then the state must necessarily step in to replace that. I mean, this is a zero sum. I know I just brought up zero sum, but this is zero sum. This is how I talk about validation. Why do you need somebody else's validation? Because you don't need your own validation. Like, there's no emphasis on your own validation. When there is a lack of emphasis on yourself and your own needs, nature abhors a vacuum. You will inevitably, you will unconsciously and inevitably, as Jung says in this quote, try to get the validation from somebody else. You can't just not care what other people think. It doesn't work that way. You have to care about what you think even more by getting really good, by building up that muscle of paying attention to your own needs. There's the zero sum between individual strength and state strength. Why do women test men? Why does your girlfriend test you? Why does your wife of 10, 20, 30 years test you? Because she's trying to make sure, yeah, she wants to make sure that you are not using her for validation. Because if you're using her for validation, that puts her in an extremely precarious situation. The individual, when he's increasingly deprived of the moral decision that he needs to make on on how he should choose to live, he must inevitably be ruled, be fed, and be clothed, as Jung says, and educated as a social unit. It's not both. It's not let's, let's increase the integrity and power of the state while increasing the integrity and power of the individual. It doesn't work that way. Another quotation here, page 14. If the individual, overwhelmed by the sense of his own puniness and impotence, should feel that his life has lost its meaning, which after all is not identical with public welfare and higher standards of living, then he is already on the road to state slavery and without knowing it or wanting it, has become its proselyte. It's converted to the follower of the state, what that means. Without our own sense of self, we become one with the state. That's just another quotation on the same theme. And so this really puts, you know, like you you hear Carl Sagan, who I like very much. I don't know if this is his original intention in the pale blue dot. You know, as voyagers leave in the solar system, it looks back on Earth and all we are, this pale blue dot. And I'm not sure if Carl uh, Sagan, did I say Carl? I don't know if Carl Sagan meant that, oh, look at how insignificant we are. I can look in, in the vastness of, of just the the solar system, let alone the, the the universe, the galaxy or universe. Look at how puny we are. It really sheds new light on these kinds of remonstrations. Overwhelmed when an individual is overwhelmed by his own sense of, of puniness and impotence, and he loses meaning. He 
unconsciously, without knowing it or wanting it, becomes the state's proselyte. And it happens naturally. It's not like you choose to become the state's proselyte. It happens naturally. And Carl Jung makes a uh, mind-body dichotomy error here. Do you see where it is? Yeah, he's equating public welfare and higher standards of living. I mean, we have to, you know, so this is spring 1956, and, you know, people, I think, may have thought at this time that, geez, maybe socialism does make people richer. I mean, maybe it's wrong, but, it, you know, it, it does help, it does help uh, raise uh, standards of living. So I'm not faulting him for this, but even, but I think that makes this quotation even more powerful, powerful. He doesn't care. He's saying maybe it does raise your standard of living. That's not the point. There's something more important going on here. Makes it even a more powerful quotation, I think. And this is from page 58. The infantile dream state of the emphasis mass man he keeps reiterating that phrase throughout the book, the mass man, the mass state and the mass man is so unrealistic that he never thinks to ask who is paying for this paradise. I think of economists going around like, I don't know, like, like the, the point is this isn't political, but, but any sort of big government program, whether it's a social program or a war, which as Harry Brown correctly points out, war is just another government program. doesn't matter what it is. But economists always come out and say, oh, well, look, it, it doesn't make sense. This doesn't make financial, financial sense. We can't pay for this. We don't have the money to pay for this. Universal health care is infeasible. Unfeas I think it's technically unfeasible, but I, I think you can use both. Infeasible. We're, we're not thinking on that level. There, there's something else going on. Similarly, if an individual is caught in a state of neurosis, we'll get to it. There's a religious function there may be a, and there's a sexual function. There may be a neurotic function. When the individual is caught up in his neurotic function, it's like, why would you go into all this credit? Why, why would you go into credit card debt to buy this stuff that you don't need? You are in an infantile dream state and you're caught up in it. You are possessed by it and no amount of logic or I don't care how many Harvard you know, economists come out and say, oh, this doesn't make sense. There's something else going on. And it's not just emotional. You know, people oversimplify this by saying, oh, you're just being emotional. That's not quite it. You're actually caught up in a specific function. A function that I think is fundamentally good. The religious function is good. Sexual function is good. And the neurotic function is even good. But we've got to use these things in the correct way and, and understand what's happening. So more on the theme of individual versus the state. This is from page 100. Self-criticism is an idea much in vogue in Marx's countries, but it is subordinated, subordinated to ideology and must serve the state. It's subordinated to ideo ideology and must serve the state, not truth or justice in men's dealing with one another. The state has no intention of promoting mutual understanding and the relationship of man to man. It strives rather for atomization for the psychic isolated individual. This is presented in the book in the context of healthy self-criticism. Like, hey, you, you know, like to, to to really strengthen individual integrity, I think Jung's specifically talking about, we need to look at our own shadow projections and identify with them and see, you know, if we're bothered by something, then it's probably something in us that we don't want to see we're projecting it out on somebody else. This is a healthy kind of self-criticism, but he's saying this is not what you, they mean by self-criticism in Marxist countries. It's not to improve relationships between man and man. We can't have that because if men's relationships are improved with each other, then it, it strengthens individual integrity and then the state automatically loses power. For the state to grow, in power and become consolidated, then connection between individuals must diminish. Again, zero sum. This is the individual versus the state. Not, I'm going to improve men's lives by making the state bigger. That's not how this works. So what's the defense against tyranny? Any kind of tyranny. Left wing, left wing right wing. It's all the same. It all looks the same in the end. But what's the defense? 
Is it learning? Is it learning about Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany? It may not be that. It may take the proper uh, understanding and relationship of man to man. It may take connection. It's not a call for reason. Let's look at what's reasonable. Let's let's look, look at common sense. That's not it. You're missing the point. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with reason or common sense. Super important. But there's something more fundamental. And that's the regulation on which the reason is based. Emotional regulation. Okay, part three. Looking at the state as religion. This quotation is from 25, page 25. Yeah, this is a big one for me. I remember reading this the first time. Brass bands, flags, banners, parades, and monster demonstrations are no different in principle from ecclesiastical processions, cannonades, and fireworks to scare off demons. But there's a big difference, as my side. There's a big difference between these. And that is this. The parade of state power engenders a collective feeling of security, which, unlike religious demonstrations, gives the individual no protection against his inner demonism. That was a huge shift for me. Yeah, it's one thing to point out that what the state does in its demonstrations, you know, look at the DNC, the RNC rallies coming up. I'm guessing this summer, right? Look at those. That is a religious procession. But the difference is, at least what religion does to some extent, and it depends on the religion, but they're all structured in the same way. It's just to, to what extent they are, they get caught up in their religious fervor and to what extent it's based on, well, man's nature and to what extent it's not. Um, religion at least makes you look at yourself to some degree. Does it use the most correct language? No, I would say it doesn't. Does it get caught up in in, in um, symbols that it makes that it mistakes for concretes? Yeah, it does. But at least religion tries to get you to look at yourself and saying, "What can you do to fix this?" Even if the fixing that they prescribe isn't isn't the most healthy thing. That is not true of a state procession. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It is a total loss of your sense of self. More responsibility placed on on the individual in religion. Another big difference, I think, is that in the state, the utopia is placed in this world, right? whereas in religion, it's placed in a completely other world. Yeah, when heaven is placed in this world, live and let live, it slowly devolves into, you better do what I say. Because if you're not on board, then this affects my ability to get into this heaven, this utopia, this ideal Marxist communist state, as the case may be. This is from page 63. You can take away a man's gods, but only to give him others in return. The leaders of the mass state, there's that phrase, mass state, mass man, the leaders of the mass state cannot avoid being deified. And it's not like, oh, don't you see that you're deifying these, uh, these people running for president? Don't you see how irrational it is? No, this is what happens if you take away somebody's gods. This is what they're going to do. And I think we do this with celebrities uh, to some degree. But, I mean, look in the eyes of a Bernie bro. I, re- I remember this guy campaigning for Hillary back in 2016. This is when I was in New York. And just this look, and he was by the subway station just handing out flyers. And, and the look in his eyes, it was just like, you're looking at an animal. I'm re-watching this documentary of the West, uh, this Ken Burns documentary of the West, uh, which is going to be taken off Netflix here in the next couple of weeks. So get on that. But these Christian missionaries going out to Oregon trying to convert the Indians, they must have had a similar look in the eye. Like, don't you see how your life is just being ruined by trying to convert these people to to your way? But it's not about that. Like, you know, their their IQ could have been very high. Doesn't matter. I'm talking about a different function. And this is from page 80. Western man is in danger of losing his shadow altogether of identifying himself with his fictive personality, the personality that he imagines himself that he wants or that he wants to be. Saying I'm not religious in 2020 is akin to saying I'm not sexual in 1950 or 1850 in the Victorian era. 
It's the same thing. Atheists are like celibates, or, or like the MGTOWs of religion. They're not getting rid of their religious function. It's just going to persist, and if you deny it, it's going to warp. And you look at these MGTOWs, you, you don't get too <laughs> far into MGTOW YouTube, and you start seeing sex doll reviews. And you're looking at the crease in, in the doll's chin and how it connects to the neck and how that takes away from the realness. I mean, it's it's sick. If they think they beat the system, and they, I'm just using them as one example. They think they beat the system. Oh, I don't. I just have to turn off my sexuality. It's like, pff, dude, <laughs> you, you, it doesn't work that way. You're identifying yourself with this fictive imagine it, uh, imagination of a personality. It's not real. All right, another theme, part four, the religious function. We talked about this already, but this would also be called the tyranny of, of mass neurosis, or really how everything that we can say about the tyranny at state level, we can say about individual neurosis. Yeah, if you think this presentation so far has been ridiculing people who are getting really involved in politics and watch the debates and go, oh, can you believe what she said to him? Oh, you think this is making fun of... Those people, well, it is, but this is also calling attention how we take on the state uh, or, or we take on the characteristics of tyranny when we have our own poorly integrated shadow. All right, so from page 27, I emphasize the natural function which has existed from the beginning. A religious, yeah, a religious function cannot be disposed of with rationalistic and so called enlightened criticism. You can, of course, subject the creeds to ridicule, but such methods miss the point and do not touch the religious function that forms the basis of the creeds. So when I'm standing up there in front of my SJW class in grad school going, oh, don't you see, this doesn't make sense. This is all based on this faulty premise. And here I can demonstrate how this premise is wrong in less than a paragraph and maybe a sentence. Completely misses the point. I'm dealing with a natural function, a religious function that cannot be disposed of with rationalistic and so-called line criticism. In fact, what really brought this theme home for me is I, I, I knew somebody at the time who had like a good life here in New York where we were living and everything seemed to be going well, but uh, he moved across the country, like completely across the country for three or four months, put his entire life on hold. Because there was this girl living in across the country. Was not dating her. Nothing like that. It's like, why would you move across the country for this girl? And then you see a picture of her and like, oh yeah, she's pretty. And that kind of explains it. Like, have you ever tried to shake your buddy out of a trance season with a girl who's especially bad for him? Does it ever work? However much you can know about sexual dynamics and Getting your life together, it doesn't matter. You can't shake him out. He needs to live it out. And the same thing is going on with this religious function. I mean, this is just a part of who we are, and I think it's a necessary part of who we are because, look, it allows us to regulate emotion in the face of self-awareness. This is something I talk about in uh, issue two of the magazine. It's extremely functional because without this belief framework, we can't regulate emotion like we like we can't, you know, and, but it's not just humans that have this, but, but we come up with these uh, religions because we have this extra faculty of, of self-awareness. I, I mean, you know, a pack of wild dogs have a kind of religion, too. Oh, we'll go on on 10 hunts and nine of them won't be successful, but one of them will be. That's in a sense a way to, to keep a, a pack well regulated. But, you know, our faculties are so much higher than than, than dogs. So we need to come up with more elaborate ideas to help us develop a framework through which we can regulate emotion. The only question is, how accurate is this religious framework going to be? How accurate are, is this belief system going to be? Not a question of whether you will have one. It's, hey, let's make this as accurate as possible. And I think we'll get into that with the solution here. Okay, this is from page 35. The West has unfortunately not yet awakened to the fact that our appeal to idealism and reason and other desirable virtues, delivered with so much enthusiasm, is mere sound and fury. 
Same with their own lives. Right? This is like this is why I always criticize CBT and like advice and mindset training and positive psychology and oh you have a negative thought. Well just have a positive like don't you see see that negative thought? This negative action is not helping you. Just take on a different one. Oh, don't you see if you keep drinking, you're gonna die in five years and your family's gonna leave you like your wife who you love threatened to leave you, yet you keep drinking. You know the heroin's killing you. You know that. You're still sticking the needle in your arm. That's why this kind of therapy, this surface level kind of therapy, completely misses the point. It fails to understand this religious, or not. that's not the religious function, that's the neurotic function that has a mind of its own, like the religious function has, like the sexual function has. Okay, so how do we use sex in a useful way? How do we use our religious function in a useful way? How do we use our neurotic function in a useful way? Now, we got to understand what it is and exactly how it works. And, of course, that's where my diagrams of emotions come in. And from page 76, the psychologist has come to see nothing is achieved by telling, persuading, admonishing, giving good advice. He must get acquainted with the details and have an authentic knowledge of the psychic inventory of his patient. I mean, this is probably, uh, I know, I, I know this is the original function of confession. I mean, therapy is confession or really confession is proto therapy. I think that's part of therapy, but, but that's something that CBT and most therapies now that you'll get on some insurance basis won't even take you through that. Just get acquainted with the details. Take a psychic inventory of the of the patient, of who you are. Without that, there's no going forward. That's something that Catholic confession got right that a lot of therapy now, now you know, gets wrong. And that is right, but that's not a complete therapy. Like I said, I think that's just step one. But yeah, it just goes to the theme of uh, great. T- telling somebody to break out of that neurosis doesn't work. There's another way around this, and here Jung gives us some indication of what that other way around this might be. Take a psychic inventory. All right, in part five, this will be the final theme. How are we doing on time? Oh, not bad. Collectivism as bankrupt. Collectivism as inherently bankrupt. I mean, this really isn't the main theme in the book. I just think that he brings up good points about collectivism and why it is just like inherently, it just doesn't work. Um, this is from page 28. As can be easily seen, community is an indispensable aid in the organization of masses and is therefore a two-edged weapon. Just as the addition of however many zeros will never make a unit, so the value of a community depends on the spiritual and moral stature of the individuals composing it. Collectivism is self-refuting on the face of it. What do we do to get somebody to change? Oh, change their community. I mean, that's what I mean by, yeah, just to be clear, what we, I mean by collectivism and individualism. Individualism is whether you can develop your own identity and collectivism is whether you, well, to the extent that the, your, your environment, your community, your social unit, people outside you develop your identity. So collectivists would say, oh, there's a problem in this community or there's a problem with these individuals in this community. Excuse me. Well, let's change the community. Well, what's the community made up of? It's just a bunch of individuals. So you still come back to how do we change individuals? Oh, let's change the school. Well, wait, the school is just a community. It's an organization. It's indispensable. We know that. But if you're talking about changing the school by simply changing the school, you are forgetting the fact that it's just made up of people. Okay, so let's change the people. Okay, but then we're still coming back to changing the people, changing the individual. Collectivism is, in a sense, uh, a distraction from you not knowing the underlying mechanisms behind individual change. You don't know that because you don't understand psychology. You don't understand how emotions work. We do, but you don't. So you just want to change the school. Or the people in low income communities, the reason why they're obese is because, you know, the the you look at the, the aisle of their food and it's just like Oreos and Nilla wafers. 
So let's put different food in the aisles. What this is, in a sense, is uh, the reversal of cause and effect. Pointing to the collective as the problem and not the individual. Yeah, it's reversal of cause and effect, but you don't know what the cause is. Yeah, so you're focused on the effect to distract you from not knowing the cause, which is the mechanisms behind psychological change in the first place. Again, go back to the drugs. Why would somebody want a row of Oreos and Nello wafers when they know that they're bad for them. Same thing with the heroin, putting the needle in his arm. And from page 55, a similar kind of uh, quotation here, but it's important to reiterate these things. A million zeros joined together do not add up to one. Ultimately, everything depends on the quality of the individual. But the fatally short-sighted habit of our age is to think only in terms of large numbers and mass organizations. Well, how do we get better food? How do we get more affordable food in, in this bodega on 145th Street? The one would think the world has, is Jung talking again, the one would think the world had seen more than enough of what a well-disciplined mob can do in the hands of a single man. Man, again, written in spring 1956, so there's a clear Nazi reference here. Yeah, we don't get this. We do not get this. This is completely contradicted. Whenever somebody says, which people say all the time, become part of something bigger than yourself. What's the meaning of life? Nine out of ten people will say, well, become part of something bigger than yourself. You don't get it. You're becoming part of something bigger than yourself. You're not really becoming part of it. You're really getting out of yourself. You're avoiding your own issues. You're abdicating the responsibility of forming your identity, in part because you don't know how. Perhaps, in part because nobody's really showed you how the neurotic function works in the context of the religious function and, sure, the sexual function to some degree. You don't want to become part of something bigger than yourself. You want to get out of yourself. There's issues you don't know how to manage, and you think that benzo hate that you get from being in a crowd is the solution, and I'm sure it feels great in the short term. Hey, you look at uh, any sort of political procession like Egypt and those riots in 2011. Hey, I bet that feels great. You're not becoming part of something. You're losing who you are. You're abdicating the responsibility of strengthening your own integrity. So what's the solution? Jung has some ideas, and I'll give you my ideas. This is from page 60, dot, dot, dot. The dissociated man needs a unifying symbol, and the Christian symbol has not been able to do this. There's no problem with Christianity. Rather, our conception and interpretation of it. This would become antiquated in the face of the present world situation. Yeah, so our interpretation of Christianity, you know, b people are always saying, oh, to um, defend against the rot and the degeneration of leftist culture, we need Christianity again. No, Christianity had its chance. No, not that there's anything wrong with Christianity. And again, not a Christian here. It doesn't matter. We need to really understand that we need to move beyond these questions. Uh, these questions of hey, what religion do you belong to it's not that christianity is wrong i think there's lots of great things in christianity but our interpretation of it holding up the symbol of the cross and jesus being crucified on that cross the symbol that that is holding that up as not a symbol but a concrete really doesn't stand up to all the scientific inquiry that happened in the 19th century as a result of the enlightenment Maybe we need to get more clear about Christianity and what it really represents on a psychological level. I think that may be more important. Yeah, maybe Christianity worked for a while. It was helpful. And it's important to talk. I, I think one of the great things about Christianity is that it is a unifying force. But what exactly is it unifying? What about us? Is it unifying? That's the question we need to answer. And this is the final sentence from the book, from page 112. I am merely concerned with the fate of the individual human, that infinitesimal unit on whom the world depends. I mean, that sums up spirituality. We'll get to it. But that infinitesimal unit on whom the world depends and in whom, if we read the meaning of the Christian message aright, correctly, even God seeks his goal. 
think a great summation of, of spirituality or spiritual experiences Henry James uh, denotes is Henry James denotes excuse me is at the same time like I'm I'm small but I'm also big so we can look back at Carl Sagan's pale blue dot now you can take that to mean and I'm not saying that again Carl Sagan meant it this way you can make take that to mean oh look how small and insignificant we are who cares or you can take that to mean on one level we're small and insignificant sure but on another level, we're the ones who built this Voyager spacecraft, and we're the ones taking this picture, and we understand what it means, and we understand what the solar system universe is, and all this great stuff. It's this strange mix of humility yet pride. That's a pretty good approximation of a spiritual experience. Just across the board, across religion, across culture, it's all pretty much the same. I'm somehow humble yet pride, yet, yet prideful at the same time. So here are my thoughts on this. I mean, Christianity existed for a reason. It approximated this state, this state that we, maybe like an elevated state. Um, it's a transcendence of yourself and how powerful you feel when you do that. And then that's Christ on the cross, just of facing the worst possible situation. And really, you create. You don't transcend yourself. I mean, you do. That's that's the process. You transcend yourself, and then the result of that, of doing the thing that you fear the most, is the creation of a new self. Yeah, and you do this by facing the thing that we most fear, the facing the thing that's the most horrible, as represented by being crucified. Uh, for I'm, I'm trying to be nice, and you're crucifying me. Like, what? what what's going on? Um. So that's the integration of Christianity as elevation. But I think something else we need to integrate too is Marxism. I mean, I th think there's a real reason that Marxism spread the way that it did. It's not because it makes sense, right? Go back to what we just learned. It's because it speaks to this religious function. I think there is something religious going on in Marxism. And I think it, it approximates this connection, this elevation and sunder. Okay, so Christianity is the elevation, Marxism is the sunder, and it approximates that state and kind of just forces it on people. So as we integrate our Christianity, I think we also need to not completely dispose of Marxism and its principles. I think in a certain context, it's 100% correct. In the context of, look, ultimately what we're trying to do is create the state of sunder with humanity. So the summation of this would be, through the connection with others, through the awareness that I get of my own issues, by connecting with others, we transcend ourself. Ourself, not ourselves, but our sense of self, our capital S self, our identity. When we transcend ourselves, we create a self. And we do this by facing the fear that we fear the most. Which, to complete the loop, we become aware of through our connection with others. That's the way out of this. That is the state of regulation from which we can go on and then maybe start reading John Locke and understand what he's really saying. All right, guys, thank you for listening. Have any questions, animus at animusempire.com. And again, schedule a free consultation, animusempire.com slash schedule. And I wish you, as always, all the joy and pain, the pain and joy that comes from well, being in touch with reality, but that also comes from proper integration of both Christianity and Marxism.